Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue with our treatment of the microwave background and begin to analyze how the Planck team uses the early maps. I previously reviewed frequency dependent sampling of the sky with WMAP and Planck in these two videos, thereby demonstrating that the signals received by these satellites are much too unstable from year to year to have any role in cosmology. Moreover, I emphasize the importance of the galactic foreground and the fact that it cannot be removed without prior knowledge. As I mentioned in this talk and years ago in this paper, an unaccountable number of other galaxies exist beyond our own galaxy. These will also be emitting variable microwave signals that are unrelated to cosmology. Besides the year-to-year -year stability problems, in these two videos, I discuss the generation of anisotropy maps using WMAP frequency data acquired in the K, KA, Q, V, and W bands. In the first of these, I emphasize that no unique anisotropy map exists, as there are an infinite number of processing methods and of possible solutions to the ILC method. However, the key point was made with the third law video. When cosmologists process their images, they multiply the intensity in a given channel with a negative coefficient and then combine the resultant with the other channels. In doing so, they are unknowingly violating the third law of thermodynamics as negative temperatures do not exist in the inverted channel. Remember, all channels are examining the same sky. That is a serious blow to any claims that cosmology can be considered a part of physics. The maps used to date the universe and to set the, all the important cosmological constants will always be scientifically invalid. Again, we will never know the age of the universe. In the last video, I presented the yearly frequency maps for the Planck satellite. Here the frequency maps are displayed once again, such that they can be viewed next to one another. As previously mentioned, these maps are plotted on a logarithmic scale and show increasing galactic contributions with increasing frequency. I also presented these images subtracting year 4 from year 1 for the LFI or year 2 from year 1 for the HFI. This was done in order to emphasize that the Planck results have no cosmological stability. Any image which appears to yield a better subtraction merely represented the use of logarithmic scale by the Planck team. In fact, none of this data displays stability required for cosmological validity. Now let's go back to the yearly maps for a minute. You might remember in the last video that I displayed these four images for the LFI at 40 GHz. Yet this is what the Planck team presents for the composite or full scan image. How is it possible to generate that image from these four? There are large acquisition problems in year 2, 3, and 4. So how can the full image look perfect? Clearly there is some serious data processing going on. The same thing happens at 44 GHz. Here are the four yearly images and here is the full scan image. Again, perfect with no sign of acquisition problems. Finally, here is 70 GHz. First, the yearly images with clear acquisition problems in year 2, 3, and 4. Next, here comes the full scan image. It is easy to argue based on the yearly images that the Planck team has been less than forthcoming in creating their full scan result. If you examine the Planck papers, you will quickly recognize that the yearly maps are constantly being reprocessed. The maps I display here are part of the second processing release of 2015. In 2018, the Planck team generated yet another set of these maps now available on the ESA website. With each new release, they claim to have better understanding of instrument errors and systematics. They then use the supposed knowledge to reprocess the yearly data for each channel, creating a completely new set of maps. Given enough continued funding, this can go on for some time, but the entire process tells us something about cosmologists. They are always able to move acquisition problems into calibration files because they have no objective measure of validity. Now in order to get the final anisotropy maps from these images, the Planck team requires a great deal of processing. 
This can range from 11 million free parameters for the low resolution analysis to over 200 million for the high resolution analysis as you can learn in this paper. Beyond this computational challenge, the first problem they have to address has to do with point sources. In generating the anisotropy maps, the WMAP team had identified a total of over 200 point sources which are not cosmological in the first year data release as you can learn in this paper. By the time the ninth year average was released, a total of slightly more than 500 point sources were identified at the Q, V and W frequencies as reported here. Here is a moleweed projection of the sky displaying the WMAP point sources. In sharp contrast, the Planck team has now identified a total of tens of thousands of point sources as you can learn in this paper and as you can see in this table. The acronym PCCS2 refers to the Planck Catalog of Compact Sources second release. There are two columns which primarily differ in the galactic location of the sources. The second column becomes more important for the high frequency channels on Planck. Some of these point sources are galactic, some are extragalactic, some appear only in a single channel, and many do not agree with any known object in the sky. These point sources serve as another degree of freedom in generating anisotropy maps. Yet, there are hundreds of thousands of galaxies that can contribute to such maps, and those signals all rest on top of any process microwave background. Some of these might simply represent sampling artifacts, and the Planck team cannot establish the physical basis for many of these point sources. Think about how this moleweed projection of the sky would look if you superimposed upon it hundreds of thousands of point sources. So how does the Planck team deal with this point source problem? First, they obviously recognize that extragalactic point sources contribute significant power at both high and low frequencies, as you can learn in this paper. Initially, the Planck team attempted to minimize the contamination from point sources by subtracting the catalog of known point sources before further analysis of the foreground and CMB maps. They confess. However, due to source variability, beam asymmetries and uncertainties in the actual catalogs, we invariably found worse results with such pre-processing. They end up abandoning the approach and hiding the point source problem in the processing of the galactic foreground. This occurs despite the fact that many of the point sources are actually extragalactic. In essence, they sidestep the point source problem. This is not a good sign as point sources provide power in the map which belongs neither to the desired CMB map or to the foreground. In a sense, the point sources are warning the Planck team that it simply is not measuring anything of cosmological value. Well, that is all for today. I realize that the video was short, but there were two very important points to be made here. First, the Planck team continues to constantly update their raw data, moving more and more errors into calibration files. Much of this is done without proper justification and is scientifically unwise as it makes the Planck results appear much more pristine and stable than they are in practice. The Planck team may well treat a feature as an artifact, but in removing it, they might also remove some associated detail that was real. Secondly, all CMB experiments will always be plagued with point sources. The Planck team now lists over 100,000. It is reasonable to assume that if we continue to survey the sky, even more will appear. The current approach is to essentially avoid the point source problem for all but the most grievous examples. But if the point sources continue increasing in number, eventually cosmologists will be masking the entire sky and left with no map at all. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did, promote the channel, mention the videos to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.